Good morning, everybody. I know we're talking to people. We've got um, folks. This is North Carolina ACDA, but I know we've got attendees from, I know we've got some friends from New York and um, the East Coast, and we've got some friends from California. So that's fantastic. Welcome. Um, not sure what other states we've got represented here, but um, my name is Wendy Looker. Um, I'm the current president of North Carolina ACDA. Um, and at, at least on my left, box on my left is Jeremy Tucker, who is our president elect. Um, and we are gonna be monitoring, uh, monitoring, monitoring our Zoom here. Um, we wanna welcome you to the virtual choir boot camp with uh, Laura Sam. And we are really uh, grateful to Laura for uh, offering her services and agreeing to share all the things she's learned during quarantine and during the pandemic about virtual choirs. Um, I do want to say that this, this boot camp this week is the, the free portion of what will be our virtual conference series, which begins on Saturday. Um, we are offering a conference series uh, once a month until October. So July 25th, August 8th, September 12th, and October 17th. We have guests coming. Uh, Deke Sharon Tesfa is coming, and um, Nation, Jocelyn Hagen, and Tim Takash. Uh, we'll have some interest sessions, reading sessions, opportunities to discuss issues in smaller groups. And Laura will be with us each month um, to lead us in a, a conference virtual choir. So we'll be working, actually participating and singing and creating a virtual choir project together that will be revealed on um, on October 17th at the end of our conference series. So if you're interested in joining us for that, um, if you go to our website, ncacdaonline.org, I'll put that in the chat later, um, you can register there. It's $30 for ACDA members, $40 for non-members, $10 for students. Um, and again, that's open to anybody uh, in the world, really. Um, so I'm not going to keep you too much longer. Let's turn it over to Laura Sam. Laura is a retired uh, music educator in North Carolina, and she's also the current artistic director uh, of Women's Voices Chorus in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. And she has very quickly, because she's so smart, become a virtual choir expert. Um, and we're really, again, we're very grateful to Laura for sharing what she's learned with us. Um, and again, this session will be repeated at 1.30. So if you want to come again and, you know, catch something that maybe you missed, you can do that. And this is being recorded. By the end of the week, we will post these on the ncacdaonline.org. That's our website. We will post it on the website. It'll be free to access and we're gonna leave it up there as long as we need to. Okay. All right, so thank you, Laura. Um, I'll turn it over to you. I'm gonna mute myself. Okay. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Wendy and Jeremy for all the planning that, um, that you did to get us to this morning. Um, special gold stars to all the folks that are joining us, not Eastern Standard Time. Y'all are awesome. <laughs> um, so I have to tell you that I, I am more nervous right in this very moment than I was in 1984 on my first day of teaching school. So I hope that y'all will bear with me. And um, if I disappear out of the meeting, it's because I somehow booted myself out and I'll come back. I'll find my way back. Uh, I did want to just very quickly share my personal journey as, um, as a you can do it sort of speech. Uh, when the when the we first went into lockdown mid-march um honestly i sat on the couch and i i uh, binge watched netflix for two solid weeks and then april 1st i said hey no fooling um this is good this is going to be a new way of life for maybe a very long time and even when we go back to whatever our preferred world of choral music making is I don't think the virtual world's going to ever leave us because I think we can find richness and fulfillment in aspects of the virtual world. And so on April 1st, I said, all right, girl, it's time to figure this thing out or be left out. And so um, that's when I started my journey. I started out with a um, little acapella app and I had a wonderful time singing um, little songs with myself and posting them for my mother to watch on YouTube. I had a great time doing that. 
I tried to involve some church choir members uh, with the acapella app. I quickly realized that it wasn't going to accomplish what I wanted to accomplish. There's nothing wrong with it. It just wasn't the best tool for what I wanted to do. And so um, May the 6th, I purchased Final Cut Pro, and then May the 8th, I purchased Logic. And so May the 10th is my virtual choir birthday because that's my first virtual choir. I made uh, four of me singing Alleluia. And I was so proud of me up on that screen singing Alleluia. Um, I could have burst wide open. I think it lasted about two minutes and it probably took me, I don't know, 50 hours to accomplish. Um, so I've come a long way since then. And uh, the, my, my biggest walk around the house crying was not, I'm so frustrated I can't learn this, but I'm so frustrated because I just wish I had a teacher. I just wish that there was somebody on YouTube talking about how do I make a virtual choir and not how do I make a pop song or what makes a hip hop tune work. Um, like there's lots of resources, but not for choir folks. And how in the world do you mix an organ and a choir? All I can find are videos about how do I make that drum set sound great. And that's not what I need. So I just would walk around saying, if I only had a teacher, I want to learn so badly, but I don't know how to, how I'm just trying to help myself. And so um, in, in one magical moment, some, somewhere toward the end of May, I discovered Troy Robertson and Cora Amore. If you haven't already discovered Cora Amore, they are um, an amazing, we are an amazing coalition of um, musicians, singers, conductors, teachers, and it's membership is free. We just help one another. Um, it was Troy's vision, and there are so many people. I, I recognize many of you on my screen right now from Cora Moore. Um, it's not a competition with ACDA. Most of us are ACDA members, I think. Um, it's just a wonderful, wonderful resource. And uh, Sean is a Cora Moore member, and I see he just posted that to the chat. So yay, Sean. Um, so. Uh, so I found Cora Moore with Troy, and Troy was offering weekly sessions on um, how to create a guide track, how to do basic mixing, how to do basic uh, video editing, and those were a lifeline for me, truly, they were a lifeline. And so um, I had more time on my hands, I think, than most anybody, um, and so I, I just, just lived it and breathed it and ate it for uh, weeks and weeks and weeks and um, just learned as much as I could. I would, so I just wanna say that with the disclaimer that I am not an expert. I'm little choral musician me who's learned some things and I would like to share the things I've learned with you and I'll try to answer any questions you have but I'm not certified by anybody. Just, I just have what's going on in my little nervous brain and um, I just want to offer you and assure you that there is a full money back guarantee if you are not satisfied with this session. So there you go. <laughs> All right. Um, I can't hear y'all laughing, but I see you smiling. So um, my sister said to say that. <laughs> All right. So here we go. I would like to start out with, um, I'm just going to share this, uh, this quick movie with you. It uh, lasts about seven minutes. And... Um, the reason I want to share it with you is because it's just an overview of virtual choir making. And um, the three people who made this movie with me, I did not know before May, um, but I met each one of them and introduced us all to one another. And uh, David Tang was doing a thing with Tim Sharp last week and he wanted to put together this movie thing. So we all recorded our segments and then I volunteered to edit it all together. And um, the very little end segment that, that took two days of editing, but now I could do it really quickly now that I figured it out. So I'm just going to share my screen and um, hopefully all this will work out. Obviously, you all know when we're in Zoom that sometimes our sync is not the best, which is why we can't rehearse together very well right now. Um, so I'm sorry if the sync is off in the video. It's A-OK -okay what I'm looking at. Um, all right, so... Get your popcorn if you don't already have it. Here we go. Greetings and welcome to this video on how to make a virtual choir. Today, I am joined by three virtual colleagues, Kathleen Hansen, Troy Robertson, and Laura Sam. Together, we will walk you through the six steps to making a virtual choir. 
Our goal is to help all of you out there who want to make virtual choirs, but may be intimidated or even overwhelmed by the prospect. Okay, so step one, pick your music and get the legal licenses. I'm going to be honest, this process can be extremely complicated and frustrating. But for now, let's say you've chosen the perfect piece of music, gotten the legal clearances for your virtual choir, and are ready to begin. Troy? Thanks, David. With that, let's move on to step two and create some guide tracks. For each part of this process, you have options, and your choices are going to determine how long your project takes to complete. You can keep it simple and create just an audio track, or you can use the audio track and combine it with video of yourself conducting or footage of the score. To begin, I make a score in a notation program such as Sibelius or Finale. I export an XML file from there, and this becomes the basis for my guide tracks. If the piece is a cappella, if there's a lot of tempo variation or fermatas, a click track really helps the singers to be more unified and expressive. This is just a percussion line that subdivides the beat. I create all of this in a digital audio workspace such as Logic, Pro Tools, Audacity, or GarageBand. Though we want our singers to read well, mixing separate tracks for your sopranos, altos, tenors, and basses with one part predominating helps them sing with confidence. Finally, if I want to create a movie guide and add visual elements such as footage of myself conducting or images of the score, I use the techniques that Laura is going to talk to us about in just a moment. Once you've got your guide tracks, it's time for step three, creating the submission procedures for your singers. You'll need a cloud storage option for this since video files are so large. I use Google Drive. Just like us, our singers are getting used to something new. For this reason, I encourage you to make it as easy as possible in your first project. I create a one-page document that includes a materials list, some helpful reminders for recording, a hyperlink that leads to their voice part guide, and a hyperlink that leads to a Google form. For materials, they need either a laptop to listen and record, or a phone and second screen. They'll also need some headphones, wired or Bluetooth, it doesn't matter which. I encourage all my singers to record on their smartphones as this keeps things fairly standardized and simple. As for recording, I like to have my singers record in portrait mode so that their face fills most of the screen and in selfie mode so that they can see whether or not they're in frame. I also encourage them to turn off the AC to reduce noise, consider what's in the background, think about what they're going to wear and to be expressive in their face. When it comes time to submit the recording, a Google form is handy because it prompts singers to submit a file instead of requiring them to figure out that process on their own. It can be confusing. Once they've submitted their video, it's time to start editing, which means it's Kathleen's turn. Thanks, Troy. The next part of the process is to edit the audio. Just like when you're rehearsing a choir, we want a final product that is synchronized, well-balanced, and resonant. There are plenty of different programs that we can use for audio editing. Some are quite simple, and some take a little bit more work to learn to use, but have broader capability for an even more professional sound. Please check out my linked Google document. There I give an overview about many of the different audio and video programs that are available for this kind of work. I'm working in Logic Pro, but most of the editing programs have a very similar layout. After I've downloaded the singer's recordings, I just drag and drop them into my project. Once you have those imported, you can just drag them right or left until they sync up. A quick tip, I will pan the guide track to the left and the track I'm working on to the right to make this easier. After they're synchronized, I'll do a rough volume adjustment on each track to get a baseline balance. Then I edit out any stray noises or loud breaths. Finally, since most of our singers will be recording on their phones, we want to sweeten up the sound a little by adding a little bit of EQ and reverb to make it sound more like it would live or in a studio. Thanks, Kathleen. A virtual choir project can be as simple as a photo collage, a classic grid layout, or as complex and creative as your time, software, computing power, and imagination will allow. I'm editing in Final Cut Pro, but there are many options from freeware to the most powerful tools that Hollywood filmmakers use. The process of video editing is fairly straightforward. It may look complicated when you see my time-lapse editing, but it truly is just a series of steps that you can follow to get your project accomplished. To get started, you'll need to import all of your clips. This will include your mixed audio, your video submissions from singers, 
any B-roll you want to use, and any still images you'll want to add to your project. After you've synced your video clips to your audio mix, you'll want to use your transform crop color correction tools to get everything looking just right. At this point, you'll also want to think about adding titles and generators to just dress your project up a bit. The sky's the limit here, but you can create something really beautiful in under an hour once you've learned how to use your software tools. After that, it's just a matter of where your creativity will take you. It's also a perfect time to collaborate with everyone involved in the project. So now that you've made your video, where can you show it? Well, when you apply for your licensing, you should have a clear idea of where, when, and how you will show your video. Will you put it on YouTube and leave it there, or will you show it once during a live presentation? Now, when considering your platform, remember that your virtual choir can reach far more people than can attend your concerts, and that people are actively searching for virtual performances by groups just like yours. For example, after my first virtual choir, a local TV station called and asked if we could perform on a special Memorial Day broadcast. Just think of the opportunities. You know, I hope you've become excited to join the virtual choir revolution, but just in case you're still a little leery, let me toss this back over to Laura. Creating virtual choirs can be challenging, but also rewarding and fun. This is a scary moment filled with lots of uncertainty, but if we work hard and help one another, we can get through it. Musicians are creative and resilient. We can carry that into this work in the virtual world. And remember, there are lots of resources out there and people like us who can help you every step of the way. Good luck and have fun. All right, hopefully y'all are still there. I can't see you yet. I've got to get rid of my final cut. All right, here we go. Yay, it looks like you're still there. <laughs> All right, um, so I'm going to stand by that. You can make something really beautiful in under an hour. That's only the video editing portion of it, and that's not anything fancy, fancy pants. That's, you know, basic, i got to get it done. Um, and I'll stand by that because the first um, project that I did for uh, church choir um, probably took more like 50 hours, but I have that same project down to 10 hours. Um, so once you learn what you're doing, you can really move things along pretty quickly. I'm going to apologize to that. I know that it sounds like a jet engine's taken off at my house. My, I don't know if anybody else is running a MacBook Pro, you understand the struggle is real with our fans coming on. So. Sorry about that. Um, all right, so let's dig into our content. Uh, so I, I did make this um, PowerPoint. The, you can think of these as the colors of the rainbow or the colors in a lifesaver pack, whichever makes you happy. Um, I, I just want to show you that red is for today, and there's a lot of slides for today. So today's going to be the most talky talky day. But then uh, tomorrow is orange, there's one slide, one, one slide green for Wednesday, blue for Thursday, and purple for Friday. So um, I do apologize for all the talking today, but it's just, I just need to get some information um, to you and then we can move on to the fun stuff. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it in, um, in this view rather than going into the, the whole screen because, oh, actually, sorry, I need to go into the whole screen so that the hyperlinks work. Uh, Wendy is going to share in the chat if she hasn't already. She's going to um, share with you the hyperlinks that you're going to see me use during the, the uh, PowerPoint. So you'll have, res you'll have access to all of, all of what I'm getting ready to show you. Uh, so this is what the way our week's going to work. Today is going to be the overview and the guide tracks, and then we're going to do audio, audio again, video, and video again. Um, so I think that uh, virtual choirs can, can be extraordinarily stressful, um, but they can also, I think this is the most growth that I've personally experienced in a very long time, 
and I've met the most amazing people like Kathleen Troy and David. I didn't know any of them before my virtual choir journey and I, I now consider them friends and so many more people but just the um, I think that I've also experienced a lot of musical growth and so I just wanted to quickly say that I think that virtual choirs are an expressive tool so the same way that we would analyze a score and think about the you know the, everything that we need to think about y'all are choral music educators so I don't need to tell you but I think this whole um, visual aspect is another way for us to dive deeply into our repertoire um, so a lot of personal growth a lot of um, connections and a lot of musical growth too the engagement that I've experienced is is with other people that are making virtual choirs but also with the people who sing in virtual choirs with me um, the amount of time that I've spent on the phone uh, with choir members helping them in the process and then just talking about life it's been a wonderful source of connection um, I say fulfillment because it it makes me really happy to to have a a beautiful thing that I can say I created with other beautiful people that created it with me that makes me feel really happy it makes me feel really happy to share this week with y'all um, those sort of things bring me a lot of joy in this dark time and also when I when I participated in my first virtual choir um, early in April whenever um, the Music Solidarity Project, we were singing Va Pensiero and worldwide people were participating in that. I, I was so awkward and I think probably made a pretty substandard video, but I was really proud that I was participating and when the, um, the release day for that video came, it felt like concert day. And when I watched it, I had that same rush of excitement and that same feeling of belonging to all the other people who had participated in the project all over the world that I realized that it, no it's not the same as as concert day in um, what might be a more traditional world but it still felt really good and, um, and I was very proud to have been a part of that project I think that we can offer that to our communities as well and then the last thing is the community so not only the community that we form when we're helping one another with virtual choirs but the people that we create them with the people that we share them with um, and I think all of this can be a tremendously um, just uh, an enriching part of my life that I would not have known had we not faced this, um, this adversity. So the challenges I think, I'm sure this list could be longer, but I think the main ones, at least for me, are just the time that it takes to learn what you're doing. So hopefully this week will help you and you won't have to spend 100 hours wandering in the wilderness. Um, the licensing, I think, is tricky but not impossible. I've already sent an email out to all the publishers of the rep that I'm using for this fall, explaining exactly what it is I'm doing, uh, thanks to all those helpful webinars that ACDAs have offered. Um, I can share with you the, the email that I sent to the publishers to give you an idea of the sorts of things I asked. I'm already getting answers. Everything seems to be very reasonable. It's just a, a hoop to jump through, and it's necessary and ethical. Um, so then obviously you have to have access to equipment and editing tools. There is a learning curve, but I promise you'll hit plateaus where you can accomplish things at a certain level and then you'll, you'll think, oh, but I'd love to do this other thing. And then you'll learn a new thing and that, that will become part of your um, toolbox. I think it's scary to jump into something that you don't know um, because it's um, fear of failure can be great, especially when so many people are are depending on us and we so want our art form to not only survive but to thrive and um, so I, I think that that fear of failure leads us to great vulnerability so this is the time for us to hold one another up and um, and to cheer each other on no matter how basic our first virtual choir projects may look that's the time for us to um, to congratulate one another and to be happy for those successes so here's some tips for success. Um, I watch virtual choirs every day. I probably watch at least five a day, sometimes more, because that's where I get a lot of inspiration. I like to look at a virtual choir and ask myself, do I know how all of the editing was accomplished? And if I don't, I, then I, I make it my, my job to go find out how it happened. Um, also, I think people have amazing ideas of storytelling in their virtual choirs and I, I love to see what people are doing. 
I think it's invaluable to practice as a participant because that's what we're asking the singers who, who we work with to do. And you will learn a lot. I know I've learned a tremendous amount from the projects that I've participated in, most especially through the Coramore projects. Um, I just consider that experience invaluable. I have learned to look into the camera with a pleasant look on my face while also looking at my score. It's amazing. <laughs> Um, so resources, there, there's Coramore, um, which I'll, I'll just open up very quickly to this wonderful website that Troy's put together. This is where you're going to see me gathering some materials from this website, and it is there for you. It's there for all of us. It's free. I did take some classes on, from Creative Live early on. I paid for a class in Final Cut and a class in, um, in Logic. But I think with now that we're gathering the choral people, the choral community together, I'm not sure that you need to turn to one of those classes, but um, they are there. My sister's a photographer and she let me know about them. Um, definitely we need to collaborate with one another and share what we know. Um, I would say start with a simple project to build confidence. Like I started with my little four part Alleluia. I probably should have just started with a two part, but I was ambitious. <laughs> uh, give yourself plenty of time. Um, uh, you know, unfortunately, I didn't have that because I was, I was uh, creating a virtual choir for the online church service at the church where I work, um, and so that was a weekly deadline, um, and that was very, very stressful at the beginning. But now it's routine and it's well in hand. I'm going to give you some suggestions about clear communication because, however, the strength of how you set up your project at the beginning is going to save you time and trouble later on. So I, hopefully I'll help you give some, give you some ideas of, of getting a good start. Um, definitely, I would advise that you establish a support system for singers. Right now, the ensemble that I'm working with at church is small. It's summer choir time. Um, you know, so I may only have five to 10 participants. I can handle that tech support for them. And also it gives me an opportunity to just check in with them and talk to them on the phone and you know, just share some time with them because I don't see them in person right now. I mean, I see them weekly on our Zoom calls, but it, it's sort of nice to have some one-on-one -on -one too. But with your ensembles, with your larger ensembles, I would definitely have a, a tech leader team, might be a section leader or, or appoint a second section leader to just help with tech issues. I don't think you want to field all of those questions because they can be numerous. Um, and then uh, you want to rehearse if you can, you want to have rehearsals, you know, like we love to do, um, because as solid as people's recordings are, um, the easier your editing will be and the more beautiful your finished product. So you definitely want to rehearse with folks and um, like you want to do and you are going to do anyway. Um, so then I also would recommend that you spend rehearsal time on Zoom. Uh, actually teaching people how to record. This is how I have my phone set up. This is how I have this and that. Um, and then consider saying, okay, everyone get your phone out and let's record us singing this one phrase, send it to me and I'll make us a little mini virtual choir and we'll see it next week at rehearsal. Um, but anyway, I, I definitely think that, that people are gonna be more willing to support, be willing to submit recordings if we will um, lead them through every step of the way and also I have found that it takes a tremendous, a tremendous amount of, um, I think support is the right word, to reassure people that their voice is good enough, that they, they do have a place in the choir, that, um, that their voice won't stick out and somehow be ugly or unpleasant, that they will be as beautiful a part of the choir as they were before March happened and COVID um, and coronavirus. This, to just reassure them, because it's very frightening to, to just sing by yourself if, if you're not a confident soloist. I know it's frightening for me, and you know, and I'm, I feel like I'm a professional at this, not a professional soloist, but certainly shouldn't be afraid to sing by myself, but it's very intimidating. So um, let's see. Next up. All right. So, so just some things. You are going to need, uh, you'll need some stuff. And um, so I just listed the things for you to consider when you're, um, when you're assessing, do I have enough of whatever I need, hardware, software. 
So I'm not really giving you recommendations on this, except to say if you have an older device um, without very much memory and with a slow processing unit and with a slow graphics card, then you may be going to have to keep your project simple. There's nothing wrong with that. Just keep your project simple and do what you can with the with access to the materials that you have. Um, the software, there's anything from uh, freeware to um, to the, the you know you can purchase, but basically you'll want to think about having notation, video, did audio um, software, and then perhaps. Uh, video convert. I like to have a converter because I like to work in all the same sort of files. There's little apps. There's the acapella app that I told you I started out with, which is really fun. Um, unfortunately, it's limited to iOS. And then there's a new app that just was released last week. I, I probably was the first person who um, who downloaded it, but it's online conductor, and it was only a dollar ninety nine. I haven't given it a try yet, but it looks like it's um, it looks like it could be really helpful. Um, Kathleen Hansen out in San Diego, she was in the video. She put together a very extensive, um, well-researched list of um, resources, and uh, that's you have a link to that, so you'll be able to open that and have a look at it. So getting started with your devices, you're going to want to record with a smartphone or a computer with a web webcam. Um, probably need to check the quality of the webcam, um, like on MacBook Pros, where we're notoriously uh, have poor webcams. Um, recording at 720p is it's going to be okay, but your image is going to look a bit fuzzy. Um, it's not the end of the world, but you may may want to just get a better webcam. Um, obviously, it's not required. And then, but you're going to need a second device to play back your guide track. So it could be another smartphone or a computer or a tablet or an iPod. You can do both on the same, like I, I did a test record, um, David Tang suggested, just open up QuickTime, record a movie um, while, and, and let that be what my virtual choir submission was. And it worked really well, except I've, I don't have a very good webcam, and so it, you know, it was a little fuzzy, but otherwise it worked really well. And that way you only need one device. So um, getting started with your repertoire, probably don't want to... Uh, Choose the most rhythmically complex piece, and also um, not the most wide vocal ranges, and something that would be a challenge for your singers. Like you want to just be totally in your comfort zone, like your pajamas with a plate of mashed potatoes kind of piece. Um, it needs to be something that everyone feels like they can worry about all the other things and not worry about the musical um, performance aspects of a piece. And then uh, secure the necessary licenses. So I've included a sample um, email that I sent. It is not any sort of official legal document. It was just what I gained from attending the webinars that I attended on um, licensing, on sync licenses. I just put together the, uh, the Women's Voices Chorus board members and I put together this template and then just send it out. We sent it out. And we're hearing responses, and like I said, they all have been um, quite reasonable and um, helping us move along with our projects. Um, so preparing your score, uh, you'll want to uh, just consider that open score is best to make guide tracks if you want to isolate. Here's the soprano part, here's the alto part, and so on. Um, you want to think about that you're, you may, you're, the score that the singers see maybe looks more like your score with, with some markings in it. So this is a score that Troy Robertson, uh, who's the, um, the creator of Coremore, the founder, this is a score that he prepared for one of our projects. So you can see that he's um, written in, you know, like don't breathe here. Um, he's also written some text stress, which, you know, was very helpful. When I was singing this as part of his project, I could just see, oh, I don't have to remember this text stress. Troy marked it in for me. And then on that first page, he, you know, again, gave instructions about recording um, the, that accurate rhythm, paramount, paramount importance. You want to keep the dynamic range rather limited um, because it's, it's, it makes uh, trying to mix the audio very unwieldy if there's extreme um, differences in the dynamics. Um, but you can see that he just prepared this very nice 
score. It's open score. It's got lots of markings in it that are helpful for singers. Um, let's see. And then written instructions regarding the recording spe specifications. This again is a document that Troy prepared and is on the Core More website. And also I have it linked in the resources. Uh, it's, it's kind of fun that we have to think about articulating our consonants in a different way for virtual choir. So uh, you will, if you're like me, um, you will want to minimize your editing time. And so you'll want to ask the singers to soften those final T's and those K's and all those consonants we work so hard to sing out. So fortissimo in a, in a rehearsal hall do not work well in virtual choir. Um, so you'll, you'll see us either talk about recording in portrait or landscape. Both of them have advantages and both of them have disadvantages. So it's really a matter of what your vision is for your design for your virtual choir, um, how you want people to record and just realize that there's problems either way, but you can overcome them with, with some practice with your singers. Um, one thing you might wanna do is just ask your singers to record you know, just an eight measure something, um, even if it's just sing a scale up and down and send me that recording. And then you can give them some feedback on their lighting, how, how they framed themselves in the, in the viewer um, before they, they go to the trouble of, of recording an entire song. Uh, making my own recordings sometimes is the longest part of the process because I sing the wrong words a lot. Uh, the other day I was making a guide track for a hymn and pretty straightforward. It's just a hymn. Um, I did 14 takes on that because I kept singing the wrong words. So, um, so you just want to realize that people like me sometimes have to do things over and over again. And uh, so we just, we need to just have it as simple as possible. Um, as far as what people dress, you know, like solid colors work well. Obviously, neutral backgrounds work well. Um, I think I'm a much more expressive singer since I've participated in virtual choirs because I've looked at my face so much for the last three, four months. Um, I'm very tired of looking at my face, but I never really looked at my face so much singing and realized that I did not have a very expressive face. And I feel like now when I sing, like I would get so serious and so intent on you know, all the things about singing that I would forget that my face was an important part of things. So I think when I, when we go back to, um, to traditional concerts, if I ever sing in a traditional concert again, I think my face is going to be more, uh, is going to be easier to look at <laughs> and hopefully more reflective of the music. Um, you can set your tempos in the notation software you use or your digital audio workstation. That's your, um, your software, your audio software depending on what software you use. Um, you're gonna export a PDF of your score. Obviously you need permission from, from the copyright holder. Generally, people are totally willing for you to do that. Um, you, you'll want to export an XML file of your score. XML is just a, a file type. And when you're in your notation software, you'll see that that's one way that you can export it. And then if you're creating a video guide track, you might also want to export, export a video of the score or else use screenshots of the PDF that you created. And I'll show you how to do all of that. Okay, so getting organized, this part is, this part I think will um, hopefully keep you feeling happy about your virtual choir project and not frustrated. Um, let's see, I've lost my cursor, hang on one sec. All right, hang on one second, I've lost, lost my cursor. Okay, here we go. Um, so you'll want some sort of storage space. I choose to use uh, Google Drive. Uh, you're probably gonna have to buy some storage space because your those video files take up a lot of room. Um, not sure that you could get it accomplished with the free 15 gigabytes that Google gives you. Um, so I pay, I think it's $10 a month. I pay for two terabytes of storage, which is probably way more than I need. But, but anyway, that's what I'm comfortable doing. So what I, here's where I'm talking about communication with singers. So I created a Google form 
for the uh, the Be the Change virtual choir project for NCACDA. This is from the Justice Choir Songbook. I'm very excited about this project. I'm hoping that there'll be lots of participants. But right up here at the top, I give the, the dates that are important. I tell people what they need. I tell people what to think about when, when they're recording, including a picture of what my um, my selfie video looks like uh, so that they can hopefully make theirs a similar size to mine. Um, I remind them that choosing a recording space that's quiet is important and also um, to not choose an acoustically live space like a shower because it's, you know, it's fun but it's not easy to mix. So um, it's not really what sounds good to you, it's what's going to sound good in the mix. So then I make a link, so this is a live hyperlink to the video guide track, which we'll be looking at in a few minutes. Um, I give some pointers about singing in a virtual choir, um, especially limiting the dynamic range and those unvoiced consonants. Um, and then I give some project notes that are specific to that project. And then this link right here is the one that folks click on when they're ready to submit a recording. So just as Troy said, let's see, I think it's not going to allow me into that hyperlink. So I'll show you that, that form because I think it's important. So just give me a sec and I will get to that form. Uh, let's see. All right, so let's see if this hyperlink is live. Yeah, okay. All right, so this is the link that takes people to where they're actually gonna submit their recording. So I just created this in uh, as a Google form. So I'm gonna, um, I linked this to a spreadsheet. So as people submit their recordings, I'm, I also have a spreadsheet so I know who's done what which I think um, is helpful. I'm not doing this with my church choir because the ensemble is so small, but Women's Voices Chorus is potentially up to 70 singers, and that would be a lot um, to keep track of without some sort of spreadsheet, I think. So if I go ahead and have their names here, I'll be ready to put their credit them in the credits at the end without doing a lot of typing myself, so I can categorize their, their parts very quickly by voice part. So this is where I'm going to click to add my video. So if I open that up, it just gives me the folder. Um, this is, you know, then they have various things that they can upload, like a second improvisation video, a second playing an instrument video. If they want to contribute some images to the project, they can upload all of those by just clicking on that file, and then it gives them an upload um, spot. And then I, I probably would want to solo some folks in the project, but I don't want them to be unaware of that. So they can just agree or not agree to have a solo. And this is a little release that I just made up, so it's not any sort of legal anything. It's just what I thought we might need for, you know, to just explain ourselves and have people either agree or not agree. Okay, so that's that. Um, let's see, whoops. Let me grab my cursor again. Okay. Okay. So there's three different guide tracks that you um, can think about making for your singers. The first one is a MIDI guide track. The second one is an audio guide track. And the third one is a video guide track. So uh, they all are very similar, but, you know, they have each their own um, little things. So uh, here we go. For the MIDI guide track, this is where you're going to need your XML file that you... Um, that you created in your score and you're going to import that into your digital audio workstation. So I work in Logic. Maybe you're going to work in Audition or, um, or you know, whatever your software is. So the first thing I do is import that file and then I assign instruments to each of the voice part. I fix anything that didn't import correctly. So sometimes there's little errors that you need to clean up. I set the tempo and the tempo changes. If they didn't import with the XML file, I can show you how to do that. For accuracy, this is for your singer's recordings. Like, how, however accurate they are, the easier your job, or whoever is um, doing your editing, the easier their job is and the better your results. So, creating a click track is helpful. 
Um, I use percussion instruments over a metronome. Um, I can I just like to have a, a control over that sound. And subdivision of the beat it can be very, very helpful, especially at tempo changes. You give a starting pitch or maybe you uh, play, you know, have a scale or a chord. Um, you can give some voiceover instructions at the beginning with a count off for singers to begin. You can also do some voiceover instructions at the end. I find that super helpful so people don't turn off their devices too quickly. Otherwise, it, it's, you can sort of fix things when you edit, but it, it just you know, gives you more work to do. Um, and then you'll bounce out each voice part as a separate guide track and upload it to your Google Drive. And now that's going to be the place that people go to when they click on the link that you gave them in the document. Um, so I'm going to go out of my PowerPoint. So give me a second here to get my cursor back. All right, I'm going to stop sharing. Um, okay, so at this point, we're going to go into Logic, which is the, um, the digital audio workstation that I work in. Let me find it. Okay. Can also tell you that things can in this square while you're also on Zoom, so y'all please forgive me if... Um, go haywire. So when I'm in logic, um, set my, my references to, to uh, Zoom. So, so let me just apply those. So hopefully y'all can hear things. Okay, so this is the um, this is the guide track that I set up for be the change for our virtual choir project. This looks super complicated. It's um, it's overly complicated because um, two things. I really like colors, and so you don't necessarily have to make things different colors, but I find that pleasant, so I do. And then I wanted to create this gu this guitar accompaniment. And I could have gotten my guitar out, um, but I wanted, I really wanted to learn how to use uh, Apple loops and, um, and create a, a guitar loop. And so that was the new skill that I was trying to work on in this project. So I created it in MIDI as opposed to just recording playing the guitar. And also this MIDI plays the guitar a lot better than I do. So that's always a plus. Um, so here are the aspects of this guide track that I was telling you about. Up here are my voiceover instructions. And so uh, hopefully you'll be able to hear this. And no, I'm assuming y'all cannot hear that because I can't hear it. Laura, your, uh, your, your screen isn't shared. Oh. And maybe I'll, yeah. So sorry. Thank you. That was Sean's voice. Thank you, Sean. You get a gold star. Sorry about that, y'all. It's hard for you to see all my pretty colors when you cannot see them. <laughs> you probably just saw me peering very closely into my laptop. <laughs> oh boy. All right, so now let's see if we have sound. Nope, still no sound, okay. Let's go, let me open my mixer, make sure that all of that looks good. Okay, I think it's definitely, oh, I know what I need to do, sorry. I need to back out and I need to share my computer in Zoom. Service and I forgot, okay. All right, let's see what happens. Are connected to your play. Okay. Okay. Sean, can you hear me? Yes. Very can good. You hear, can you hear logic? Make yes. sure your earbuds. Yay. All right. Success. Small victories. We have to celebrate them. All right. Um, so here's what I've done. I've just recorded myself saying some things that I want the singers. I've already written these. I've already talked about in rehearsal. But while those singers have those earbuds in their ears, I want them to hear these things again. So this is what I say. Welcome to this virtual choir project. 
Make sure your earbuds are connected to your playback device so that you hear your guide track while you sing, but you do not record your guide track. Position your recording device in the landscape position at about eye level. Stand or sit about two feet away from your recording device. Your video frame will be cropped, so please minimize side-to-side -side movement while you sing. Press record on your recording device. Be still and prepare to sing. Okay, then we're gonna get our B, get our starting pitch. One, two, sing. And then I start people in. Um, so when I when I created this guide track um, for the various parts, what I'll do is I'll bounce this. If, if you're not familiar with audio terms, um, in April, if you asked me what bouncing meant, I'd be like, um, well, that's what you do with a ball or when you get in trouble at a bar. You get bounced or you bounce a ball. I don't know what bounce means in, um, in audio world. What it basically means to export or to share. So you're going to bounce out um, the, you can bounce out each voice part separately by just choosing to solo those parts, you know, solo the accompaniment and the, you know, all the other things, or you can mute the ones that you don't want to hear. In this case, it'd be easier to just mute the alto tenor and bass um, when you're wanting to, um, sh to bounce just the soprano guide track. I think singers like to sing with harmony. And so I like to bounce out also one that has all four voices and then but then ask people to record with just their voice part just just for accuracy um so all the the most amazing guide track would in addition to these midi um voices would also have real voices singing so with um with chorus when we start our rehearsals in the fall after we've worked on music for a bit i'll um i'll ask the section leaders to Go ahead and send me their recordings first and then i'll add the section leaders voices into this guide track which i'll just line up to these midi tracks um, which makes it a lot more pleasant for for people when they're singing also helps with less experienced singers be able to hear someone else singing the words so they can try to line their their entrances and exits and their consonants and everything you know, with another human voice as opposed to um, a MIDI voice. So um, the purple is the um, is the percussion that I set up. Um, this the heartbeat is just and one, and one. The drum is you know what you're hearing throughout. But um, let's see, let's see if I can open this up. All right. So I just opened up, pressed my E key to open up the editor for this drum part. Why can't I see it? Where is it? All right, let me close that out again. Let me see where I am. Whoops, sorry. Uh, okay, so what I had done was I had grouped these tracks together. I wanted to learn how to do a track stack, and so I was actually in my summing track. Maybe if I'm actually in my, um, oh, gracious. Command Z will be your best friend. It is mine anyway. Um, when I'm in this actual track, let's see if I can see it. All right, I don't know why I'm not seeing my drum. Okay, but I'm not going to waste any time with that. What I did was I um, created the drum so it says one, two, three, four. I just changed the velocity so that one was louder and three was second loudest and two and four. Um, were not as loud as the others and that also helps the um, I think it helps the click track to not be annoying Some of y'all have just met me and I think I've talked about how I don't want to be annoyed already like five times <laughs> All right here at the end this is um, This is where I've subdivided the beat so let me get sorry I know this makes some people dizzy so let me just play this last little bit so you can see how that works. Hold and to and off. Be still. Now stop your recording. Please review your recording to make sure that it is free. Okay, and then I, I blab on for, you know, what they need to do about um, reviewing their recording. 
Okay, so this is what um, the, all of this looks like. Uh, to start this project out, I, um, I went in Sibelius, which I should have open somewhere down here. Okay, so I'm in Sibelius for this. And I just, um, so I, oh, sorry. So I created the score. I, I put the tempo change in here. So what I did was I said, all right, right at this measure, the tempo is 88 beats per minute. But by the time I finish, I want that retardando to take us down to 53 beats per minute. And um, I, but I grade that out because the singer doesn't need to see that. Um, you know, we don't normally see that sort of thing in our score. So it just has it, the retard is all that, that they see. But that's where I started subdividing the beat so that we could stay together. And at the very end, I say one and two and off. As a participant of virtual choirs, that to me is one of the confu most confusing things about recording is do you want me to end on the next downbeat? Do you want me to end at exactly the end of this measure? Like, where do you actually want me to end singing, especially if it ends in a, um, a voiced consonant? So um, I have the score created the way I want it created. And then um, when I go to, um, to sharing it, oh, sorry, I want to go to exporting it, um, I can export it as a PDF. I can take pictures of it, you know, however that way. I can also export it as a video. So I've done both of those things um, so that I can show you how that works. But I also want to export it as an XML file and the XML is what I want to bring into my, um, into my Logic or my digital audio workstation. That's the thing that's going to turn those voices into MIDI files. And obviously, you know, you'll have to actually do that. When you, when you bring the XML file in, these um, these tracks won't have voices assigned to them so you'll see them but you won't be able to hear anything you'll have to uh, click on the track and then go to whatever sound library that you have um, so over in logic um, you know I, why not cho choose a Bosendorf for a grand piano um, and then put it over here some people like to use clarinet or strings or whatever but you have to assign the voice to the um, to the track, or you won't be able to hear it. The percussion, Mara, yeah. When we have some questions, so when the singers oh. are recording on their device, do yes. they do that at full or half or low volume? The guide track is up as full blast as their ears want it to be, um, because the 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 earbuds or headphones are connected to the playback device, which means that um, that the recording is just their voice with no guide track on it. If people are using um, Bluetooth earbuds, they have to know how to turn their microphone off or somehow make some sort of microphone adjustments. I don't have Bluetooth earbuds, but I had a singer submit a track and I could hear the guide track bleeding through on his recording. And we figured it out was because it was something in his Bluetooth mic settings, but I have no knowledge of that because I don't have any of those. Um, what else, Jeremy? Yeah. Our other only other question is when you can, can you play um, the the bit from the beginning? Oh, um, you you all will have um, you'll have a visual reference of that when I show you the video guide track. And so hang on because you'll be able to see it, which I think is easier than me just repeating it right now. At least for me, it's always easier to see something. Um, what else, Jeremy? That's it. Thank you. Okay. Jeremy, was that your voice that was talking earlier and I thought it was Sean? No, it was oh, okay. definitely was Sean. Sean. Okay. <laughs> All right. So both y'all get gold stars now. Okay. Um, All right. I think this is all that I needed to show you about what a MIDI guide track looks like. So I just opened my mixer by pressing the X key. And so this is, this is everything. So y'all, this is way, way more complicated than what a, just a typical guide track needs to look like. But I was just trying to learn some skills. And so, and plus it was for North Carolina ACDA. So, you know, I decided to put on fancy pants for that because I love North Carolina ACDA and I wanted to make it as fun as possible. You could get by with much more, um, much less, much more bare bones and everything be beautiful about it. But let's say that I'm ready to, to bounce things out. 
I can either Command B or I can just hit my um, my stereo out bounce and then go through the 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 steps to bounce. So I'm um, obviously I'm not talking to y'all a lot about specific software because everybody's going to be just a little bit different and those are the sorts of things that you can find really helpful YouTube videos on. Um, so anyway, hopefully you'll understand that I'm just going to kind of skip through some of those more logistical kind of things. Okay, the next, uh, the next audio, let's see, oh, I need to go back to PowerPoint. Alright, so that was everything on the MIDI guide track. So the next is the audio guide track. This will hopefully make anybody who's feeling a little bit nervous right now, this will make you feel better because all you're going to see is, um, is waveforms of sound and I think we're used to seeing that because it's our voices. So instead of importing an XML file, I'm going to import an accompaniment track. Um, whatever is going to be the thing that's going to be the foundation of the project, so maybe it's the accompaniment, maybe it's the soprano or bass part of an acapella piece, like whatever you think is going to form the, the backbone of that project, just get that in your, um, in your workstation first. And then, um, you know, just then record any other additional parts that you want using that first thing you imported as your guide track. Um, you can create a click track if you want. Um, David Tang suggested that if the accompaniment's in there first, he just taps a pencil so that his, his sense of rhythm is, you know, becomes that guide track. Um, you can subdivide the beat with that pencil tapping, but think about it especially during tempo changes. Again, you want to give your starting pitch if it's a cappella. Um, again, give your voiceover instructions at the beginning and the end, and again, bounce it, bounce it out at the end. So, Laura, there's some questions. Can uh, is it good? Yeah. So, one question is, how did you make those MIDI tracks, which you yeah. kind of answered? And then the other is, please talk about the benefit of a MIDI guide track versus an audio guide track versus video. Do or do we need all three? Uh, you definitely do not need all three. You'll um, whoops. Oh, there's the question slide. Yay. Um, so let me just figure out how to get back to logic. Hang on a second. My brain is working, but not very fast. I need to escape out of here. Okay, let me get back into logic. Okay. Um, all right, let me let me answer the how do I do the MIDI thing at the end if we have time because that's something you can definitely catch a YouTube video on and uh, just remind me Jeremy that I need to circle back to that. So um, let me finish just showing all three. So you saw the MIDI, now you're going to see the audio and that next you're going to see the video and then I can quickly tell you what I think the advantages and disadvantages are for each of them. Um, so you'll recognize these are the same instructions that I gave on the other, uh, on the MIDI. This was, this is the organist playing uh, the organ part for the hymn for next Sunday. So that, I put that into the workstation first. Then the organist, who's also a wonderful singer, Matt Britton, he, shout out to Matt, he then, he listened to himself playing the organ and recorded himself singing the bass. And then he listened to himself singing the bass and recorded himself singing the tenor, sent me all three of those files. I imported them and um, lined them up. So here's, you know, here's the magic of what's happening in a software program is that you, know, you can see things and line things up visually and then you can listen. But I'm looking at this right here. Like, I'm not sure if Matt actually started singing or if he just took a big breath right there. So I'm going to come up here to my waveform zoom. I'm just going to make it bigger. It's not making anything louder. It's just making the visual form bigger. And now I can see, oh, there's his breath right there. But he started singing about here-ish. And so you can just roughly line people up. Sometimes the beginning is not the best place to look because people are nervous starting out. So you might want to go, like, to the to another place where there's an obvious start and then just sort of see okay things are lining up now notice that's not exact but when you listen to it it you know it's it sounds great um, 
there's a way that you can you'll learn later in the week how to shift people that if they really are they really do have an inaccurate entrance or they you know they've got a consonant just really in the wrong place uh, we can time flex those and line things up but um, for the for this you know just looking at it I can see that that's super close so I'm just gonna show you that then I t I I record the soprano and alto and so I use this as my guide track so what Matt recorded I put my earbuds in and I record directly into my um, my logic and I record myself singing soprano I record myself singing alto I make sure that those are all lined up sometimes there's a, a teeny bit of a delay um, and so I'll, I'll just need to fine-tune those and so now I have all four of our voices plus the organ and this is what I send out to the singers um, Here's my mixer. I just press the X key to, to get out. So here's the organ. Uh, it's, it's kind of low because I just want the singers to hear it in the background. And then here's each one of the voices. So I would just mute the ones that the alto or the um, tenor, alto, and soprano. And I would just bounce this, out, bounce this out with instructions, organ, and bass singing and send it out to them. And then also send them all the voices so they can just enjoy, you know, singing with the harmony in their ears. Um, and I just do that for each part and then put it in the, in the Google folder and it's ready to share. Um, this, this part is, can, you can do this really quickly unless you've got to record your part 14 times because you can't sing the correct words at the correct time. <laughs> all right, then the third way of having guide tracks is with Final Cut. And at this point, I have Zoom, Logic, Final Cut, PowerPoint. I've got a lot of things open, so um, just please don't be shocked if things start going haywire. When you're working in your, um, in your software, I really encourage you to close out of everything else and maybe even your browser if you're having some trouble. Okay, so here's, here's the video guide that I made. So let me just tell you what the components are. Also, again, it looks so overly complicated, but I'm going to use this beginning part for every single video guide that I make, so I'm not going to have to keep creating this. I'm just going to do that one time and be done with it. Same as the end. I only have to create that the one time, and then I can just keep reusing it over and over again. So here are the components. I bounced out of that MIDI project that I first showed you. I have these clips um, inactive. I'm just pressing my V key, which activates these clips in Final Cut. Um, so you can see that when I bounced them out, I bounced it out with soprano, alto, tenor, bass, and then the SATB. But I, don't, I won't have all of these playing at once. I just need one at a time. So I just make them inactive, the ones that I don't need to, ex to share in a, a video guide. Um, so there are my audio tracks. This is, these are my uh, voiced instructions. And so I'll just play the beginning part of this video so you have a, an idea of what this looks like. Welcome to this virtual choir project. Make sure your earbuds are connected to your playback device so that you hear your guide track while you sing, but you do not record your guide track. Position your recording device in the landscape position at about eye level. Stand or sit about two feet away from your recording device. Your video frame will be cropped, so please minimize side to side movement while you sing. Press record on your recording device. Be still and prepare to sing. One, two, sing. Okay, I'm going to skip over. So it continues like this through the whole song. Um, you can see, actually, um, you can see that the video is, uh, the score is a video that's scrolling 
but you can create the same thing um, with just some PDFs, I mean some uh, screenshots of a PDF. So when we get to the end, here's what happens. and off. Be still. Now stop your recording. Please review your recording to make sure that it is free of distortion and that there are no sounds other than your singing. Thank you for being part of the Be The Change virtual choir. I look forward to hearing you sing. Okay, so the other thing I want to show you before I take some questions and um, quit screen sharing is that, um, okay, here are the audio tracks that I was telling you that we mixed in in our audio workstation. This, it, this white thing is just a generator um, because when I first did this, I didn't realize that all of, all of these right here, which are inactive right now, um, they're they're all um, transparent transparencies of the score so each one of these is a phrase and it just skips you know it just makes the new phrase whenever the music gets there um, but when I when I took these screenshots I didn't realize that I had transparency checked and so I just had to put a white background underneath them but otherwise that white background wouldn't be there because I would just do it with um, you know as a, a regular screenshot and not a transparency so I just have both of those stacked up so that you could see either way. Um, and then my video is, is laying on top of that. Okay, so that is all of these. So I'm going to um, stop sharing for a moment because I wanna tell you quickly what I think the advantages and disadvantages are and then we'll have a few minutes for questions. So um, the advantage of a MIDI file, a MIDI guide track, is that you can have absolute accuracy. You know, MIDI doesn't make mistakes, so it's not gonna be a little bit late or a little bit early or whatever. It's gonna be exactly where you put that, um, that voice to be. Um, you're not gonna have any issues with, with uh, human voices that, um, that perhaps are not accurately singing pitches. And I just wanna throw this out there. Perhaps one of the most humbling experiences I've had in this whole virtual choir journey is editing my own audio tracks. Y'all, I thought I could sing in tune. I honestly thought that I could sing in tune. I have discovered that, um, that I, whenever at, at the end of a word, if it's a, a voiced consonant at the end of the word, it is sharp. And if it is a voiced consonant at the beginning of the word, it is flat. And my vibrato sometimes looks like this. Um, and sometimes I'm just uh, so on the wrong note that logic thinks that I need to be on a different note. Um, so I just want to say that it, it can be really humbling and also eye-opening um, in a really good kind of way if you let yourself grow into it and not, <laughs> not uh, go into the depths of despair. Um, but MIDI can be super accurate. Um, you can add in all those sort of instruments if you want some other you know, sort of fun things. Um, but that's what I think the, the advantage is. Um, the disadvantage is that you have to create that XML file or do it by hand in, in the workstation, which is tedious, I know, because I, I did one. Um, and then the advantages of the audio guide track is um, it's the quickest one of the three. You know, you just got the accompaniment, you just got the voices, you can make it happen very quickly. It's probably fine, it is probably accurate enough, um, especially if you clean that up before you send it out to people to record with. Um, so that's what I use for church all the time and, it, and, and the singers are, are doing beautifully. Um, the, the third thing, the video guide track obviously takes the most amount of time because you're gonna then have to go the extra step of video yourself conducting which is a little weird for us as choral conductors. We are the ones that make a gesture and then the sound happens. But this way you have to listen to your guide track and record yourself conducting to the guide track, you know, which is just weird um, because that's not, what, that's not what we do. And so I, what I discovered was when I videotaped myself conducting, 
I actually have to nudge it forward just one frame. I'm one frame behind um, the sound. So I just have to nudge it forward and then my gesture will line up with the beat. Um, but I think for a complicated piece, which hopefully will all you know graduate to doing more complicated things, then your singers really will need the sort of conducting guidance that you give them in a live performance or in a rehearsal, you know, with all of those expressive gestures that we've all honed for years and years and years. Um, and also um, the responses I've gotten from folks is that singers ache for that. Like they want to see you conducting. That's what they, that's what they see in rehearsal. Like they want to see your face and they want to feel like they're interacting with you, even if it's virtually. And so, um, I think that that's super helpful um, about a video, especially if you learn to have a pleasant look on your face, like I've finally learned to <laughs> not look like a scary monster. Um, and then the, um, the other advantage of doing the video guide track is with permission, you know, so obviously I'm getting publisher permission. Um, I can scroll that score. So far, nobody's charged for that. Everybody said that's free. You want to use that in your rehearsals, your guide tracks, whatever. There's no charge for that. I can, I can scroll that score and then people can watch the score, watch me while they're recording and then everything is, you know, face on and you don't have some sweet person record their entire um, recording with their music like this. This does not make for a pretty video, <laughs> nor does it, you know, they're going to be disappointed when they see that. They don't realize that's what's happening. Um, and so if the, if the score is scrolling on their screen, then nobody's holding music and they're not doing this either, which is very annoying and sometimes impossible to edit out um, when you're doing your audio editing. All right, so I'm going to look. I think there's some questions. Um, maybe Wendy and Jeremy, since y'all have been seeing these, are there any that have come up a lot? I put them all in your text. Can you look oh. at your phone? Yes, ma'am, I can. Ooh, I'm and on I... my phone during class. Nobody tell. <laughs> <laughs> or everybody tell. <laughs> All right, check group text with Jeremy. Okay. All right. Um, I think if you start with Sean. Sean. Question from okay. Sean. All right, question from Sean. Do you record with your built-in mi built microphone on a computer or another USB microphone? Um, when I'm making the guide tracks for church, I just record um, in my digital audio workstation. So I'm just pressing, I create an audio track, I press record and off we go. Um, when I'm using my phone, I, I, I think that the, the microphones that are on most of our phones are absolutely fine, good enough. But at the very beginning of this, you know, I, I wanted to get all fancy pants. I also thought that I had extra money laying around. And so I bought this microphone, which is um, a Shure MV88. And it just clips into the bottom of my phone. It was about $150. And I don't think that I can hear the difference in the sound quality of just using my phone and using this microphone. And I'm the one that's editing the video. So, you know, I'd be able to hear it. I don't think it's enough to spend $150 over unless, you know, you just ache in to do it. You do have more control when you have a microphone because, you know, you can change your, your gain and um, I don't know. I, I don't think that was money well spent, but I didn't know till I tried. And you might prefer it, so not saying don't do it. Um, let's see, question from Brooks. Could Apple's guitar garage band be powerful enough to do all this? GarageBand is sort of the simple version of Logic, and so you will not have the editing tools that you have in Logic, but you absolutely can make some really beautiful, wonderful things. So, um, you know, if buying Logic is beyond your budget or you don't have the, the computer hardware that'll handle it, work in GarageBand or work in another freeware. You can make beautiful things. Um, you may, it, it just, you just can't do as much. Um, it's maybe a little bit like riding a horse and buggy from Hall River to Raleigh or getting in a fancy car. You know, I want air conditioning. So what I started out with freeware and what I realized was that I just wasn't going to get where I wanted to go. Like my vision was more that than the freeware could accommodate, even if I learned everything about the freeware. 
So I only spent a few days in the freeware before I said, okay, I, I really just need to bite the bullet. And for me, because I'm not teaching right now, Logic and Final Cut were $4.98. But for educators, um, it's $1.99 for both of them, which is uh, worth every cent. Um, can my Coral Lab be used in conjunction with resources that Laura's sharing? I don't know about Coral Lab, so I can't answer that question. Um, if we purchase practice tracks from Coral Tracks, can we import these into the DAW and then add instructions? Yeah, you can you can import any so you can import an MP3. So however those tracks are saved, and then just add another audio um, track to put voiceovers. Yeah, you could you can you know bring in anything into your workstation. So that's a great idea. What do you recommend for a teacher who has little or no experience in using this type of audio software? Yay, Jennifer, you have come to this session because that's what you do. So I didn't have any experience at all using any of this until May and uh, when I bought Logic on May the 8th and look what I figured out since then. You, you can figure it out. It's a really, the software is not to be afraid of. Software is to just learn how to use it and if we, y'all, if we can teach music, we can learn software. We got good solid brains that understand the details and the complexity of moving parts. We can do this. Um, Jeremy, are you creating the score by yourself in Music Score Software Finale, or are you uploading a file in the Music Software? Both ways. So um, you can, in your whatever your notation software is, so I'm using Sibelius, um, you can import an XML file, and you know then you'll have to just do whatever sort of adjustments you want to do to it, or just create a score in your notation software, how you normally would do that. So, you know, lots of different ways to handle that. Um, Carol, why do, why do you have singers record video horizontally rather than vertically? That's funny. My friend Troy, who you saw at the beginning of the video, his absolute go-to is, is portrait. My absolute go-to is landscape. It really is, I think, more what you get used to using because every argument that I gave Troy well, if, if you do this way, then the singer's heads don't get too big in the video because then I can't edit with some giant head in the video. And he said, no, but if you do it this way. And so whatever argument either one of us had in our very friendly conversation, the other one countered it with the same. So I would say whatever you're comfortable with, just go for it, but you want it to be consistent. You want all your people recording one way not a mixture because you will not like the way that looks at the end of it. However, if you've got instrumentalists, you've got people who are doing things other than singing, have them record whichever direction best accommodates, you know, whatever is they're doing, dancing, you know, goodness, put some dancing in there, you know, whatever. But your singers, um, try to have them consistent. It, you'll be glad you did later on. Um, which program was used to make the guide track with the scrolling score and the conducting video above? I used Sibelius. Oh, so I'll tell you this little trick I discovered. We've got a couple minutes left. Um, the, the, the video score, you know how in Finale and Sibelius they've got that moving green line? Okay, some people are perfectly happy with that green line, but that annoys me. I know you're surprised to hear me say that things annoy me. That green line annoys me because my, my eyes don't track at the same speed as that green line. Maybe I want to look ahead or whatever. I don't want that green line dictating my music reading. So what I did was I, I, um, I exported a video of the score because I found that Final Cut will only, my, my video editing software would only recognize it with the green line. And I'm like, no, no, you don't. There's a workaround for that. I'm gonna figure it out. So I opened up QuickTime and I set it to record my laptop screen. And then I opened up the score in Sibelius, no, no, I opened up the, the video because you can check the little box that says take out the green line. Um, I checked, I unchecked that so the green line was gone and then I just recorded the score moving and the green line not there. And then I took that little movie that I'd made in QuickTime just recording my desktop. Um, I took that and I imported it into, um, into my video editing, into Final Cut. And obviously you've got to line that up to your audio score that you already imported, but it's pretty easy because you know, you're looking for that downbeat and we all know how to see a downbeat. 
you know, you're looking for that downbeat and you, you know, you just line it up to your audio and, and there you go. Also, when I did it that way, it let me have some extra time at the beginning so that you could actually see the score before you started singing, as opposed to Sibelius, just boom, there it is, go. Um, and also gave a little time at the end where it, it could sit there for as long as I wanted. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, and people are, uh, Steve Hopkins added, you know, if, uh, if you want to start out with some public domain works and you go on CPDL, a lot of those XML files are already there ready for you to use. You may have to do a little bit of cleanup on them, you know, if something's a little bit, um, a little bit off kilter about it when you import it, but for sure. Um, let's see, with your method, it sounds like there needs to be two screens, one to watch your video score and another to record. Yes. So what I do is, it, let's say I'm using the guide track with me videoing and the score scrolling. So I've got my phone and I have it positioned, you know, like right above the top of my laptop screen. I have an old music stand that one of the eight, one of the ninth grade boys left at a talent show 30 years ago and never came back for. So I got my mic stand and I just have a clip, a phone clip, and I have that right above my um, right above my um, eye level so I can see the, the conducting the score and the um, and my phone is recording right above. I did notice, I did find this out that, um, you know, it's not find out. I knew it. I knew my camera was here, but human nature says, look at the face. And so, and also I wanted to see how goofy I looked while I was singing. So I would record with myself looking here. And then when I'd look at my recording, like my eyes are all you know, over to the side. I'm like, that is not good expressive singing. So when I first, I had to train my eyes to look over here. I just put a little, um, a little bright sticky with a smiley face over here where my camera was. And I trained my eyes to look up from my score. And I was only allowed to look up at the smiley face sticky, not at my face singing back at me. And then I ended up, yay. Now my eyes are looking straight ahead. <laughs> it's been a wonderland of discovery. I just want to say. <laughs> All right, let's see. Um, I think that's all of the questions. Anything else? Because it is 11.29. Oh my gosh, I got through the whole lesson and it's 11.29. I am so excited. <laughs> Anything else from Jeremy or, um, or Wendy? No. You wanna <laughs> tell us what, what we're doing tomorrow? Yes, yes, y'all. And thank you so much for coming today. I just wanna say how much I admire each one and every one of you for what you're doing today, because I I am sure that you are just here because you want to um, you want to learn and grow and do the best you can with your students and your and your singers. And I have such admiration for this Zoom room full of people who not only want to survive in the choral world, we want to thrive in the choral world. And I applaud you. I'm so grateful to be part of you. All right, so here's. Um, Let's see, hopefully, let's see, let me screen share again. And I'm doing this again this afternoon at 1.30. So if you want to come back, I'll just do the same thing again. If you want another go at it. And Wendy um, is recording this, so you can always hear it again too. Um, you can watch and hear it again at a later date. So tomorrow, no more red. Tomorrow is on to orange and we're going to do some basic audio mixing. And then um, on Wednesday, we'll do some advanced audio mixing, Thursday, basic video editing, and Friday, we're going to do some really fun things. I can show you how you can make all the singers do cartwheels around the organist. Um, that's going to be my last virtual choir for church. I'm going to have all of the singers with like sparkly fireworks all around them twirling, maybe coming out of the organist's head, um, like up in the organ pipes. Uh, I'm, I'm, yeah, the, last, the last virtual choir video I make for church is going to be special. <laughs> <laughs> well, are we? Okay, so thank you, Laura. This is just amazing. We're so grateful You're for so your welcome. time and your expertise. Um, okay, so there's a separate link, a different link that I sent out for 130. The 130 session has a, a different link. Um, please, you can email me at president at, uh, I'll put my email in the chat right now, just in case anybody needs to contact us if you have any trouble getting in. Um, hey, Wendy, may I just, oh, yeah. I just, 
I just noticed uh, Melissa said, Laura, were you truly starting at the very beginner, beginning level with all of this? And you said yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. My, my logic birthday was, my final cut birthday was May 6th. My logic birthday was May 8th. And I made my first virtual choir on May the 10th. So I promise you, I am just starting out and, um, and you can do it. You can do it. You okay. say so. <laughs> you can do it. You can do it. <laughs> so same time tomorrow, 10 o'clock, or again, we're doing it again at 1.30 if you want extra time. Um, and, and if you don't have the Zoom link for some reason, my email is there in the chat and um, we will help you get in. Okay, thanks everybody. Thanks, Bye. Laura. Through the wave. Through the waves. <laughs> Yay. Bye, everyone. Bye.